Hello and welcome. My name is Ariola Pira. I'm the curator at the Verilis Center for Art and Politics. And on behalf of my colleagues, our board and our academic home, the New School, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's inaugural Rethinking Residency Symposium. As an art worker whose curatorial interests and professional practice has led me through over 10 years as director, founder of international artists and curatorial residency programs, much of that in collaboration with many of you in this room, I'm especially thrilled to introduce this three day of conversations, lectures and videos on visual arts residencies. As part of this invitation to rethink residencies as critical sites of production, I'd like to briefly tell you how we do that at the Verilis Center, a platform for public scholarship on art and politics at the New School. The Verilis Center Fellowship is what we would call a low residency or better yet, a slow residency. It is a two-year fellowship program through which we support the development and presentation of outstanding art and research projects by international emerging artists, writers, scholars, and activists. Launched in 1994, the cultural critic and curator Maurice Berger was its inaugural fellow. Here's what he wrote in our 2018 publication, Art, an Index of Politics, celebrating 25 years of BLC fellowships. Quote, I was awarded the very first Verilis Center Fellowship in 1993, as it turned out at a critical juncture in my career. As my work focused increasingly on race, my stock in a university and museum world, largely controlled by white people, declined precipitously. The center, with the blessing and support of, of this amazing benefactor for whom it was named, provided a safe space to explore controversial and difficult issues. Out of that fellowship emerged a number of key projects, including White Lies, my experimental memoir on race and whiteness, and retrospectives of the work of Adrian Piper and Fred Wilson. I will always be grateful for the support and encouragement. As the first fellow, Maurice shaped what the fellowship became and brought to it the many artists and thinkers that followed him. Like Maurice, many of our fellows who would otherwise struggle to find support because of the experimental, political, and or research intensive nature of their work, have found space, support, financial or otherwise, to make significant work at critical moments in their career. Our model, not unlike many of the programs you'll hear about over the next three days, is to provide artists, curators, and writers with space and time. Over two years, our fellows engage with our biennial focus theme. Our current focus theme is that of protocols. And while they don't get a studio or academic home, its world-class faculty and research resources provide the space to explore experiment and produce new projects. Increasingly, we are commissioning and presenting their ambitious projects. On Thursday, you'll hear from our 1999 fellow, Susan Hapgood, speak about curatorial residencies. You'll also hear from our 2018-2020 Jane Lombard fellow, Emily Jassir tomorrow, whose short-term residency took place during the Verilis Center Forum 2019, as part of a gathering of an international cohort of fellows. Be they two weeks or two longs, the questions of communing, structures of support for the whole artist, representation, accountability, and solidarity persist across all of our organizations, whether we call our programs residencies, fellowships, or something else. The questions of hosts and guests will inevitably come up in our discussions over the next three year, days. And as we're all gathered online, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm an uninvited guest on the land that I reside, and I'm speaking to you from Manhattan on the unceded territory of the Lenape and other indigenous peoples. Access and language will too come up. And while the spoken English will, and while English will be the spoken language, I'd like to point out that the symposium features American Sign Language and closed captioning. You can please turn that on at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I myself am wearing a green shirt and have brown short hair. With that, I'd like to thank our ASL and closed captioning interpreters the wizard production team behind um, this event. Huge thanks to the resourceful team at the Verilis Center, especially my colleague, Adrian Ume, who's sitting across me right now. I want to acknowledge the support of our board, the new school, and funders who make our work possible. Before I turn it over to Carrie Conte, a trusted colleague and friend who will introduce Rethinking Residencies, I'd like to thank her and the entire Rethinking Residencies team and members for their intrepid leadership and vision as well as all of the members and especially our speakers who answered our invitation to rethink residencies together. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the next three days.
Hi, thank you all so much. It's so exciting to be here and that this symposium is happening. Uh, firstly, I want to thank Ariola Pira um, for your remarks and thank the entire Vera List Center team and especially Adrian Ume and Karen Coney for partnering with Rethinking Residencies on this symposium. And in a moment, we will begin a slideshow um, which goes through the 16 member organizations of Rethinking Residencies who are all doing such important work and have such incredible programs. Um, and Rethinking Residencies member institutions have a wide diversity of approaches and scales. And you'll see that in the slides that um, will play as my talk goes on. Um, the members of Rethinking Residencies are Abrams Art Center, iBeam, Fire Island Artist Residency, Flux Factory, International Studio and Curatorial Program, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, uh, Queens Museum, Pioneer Works, Recess, Shandaken Projects, EFA Project Spaces, Shift Residency, Triangle, Wave Farm, Wave Hill, and WOW Project. Rethinking Residencies began in early 2014 with the idea to convene an informal meeting of residencies in the New York region to discuss our programs in the context of critical questions around residencies. At that time, I was director of programs and exhibitions at the International Studio and Curatorial Program, where I am currently senior advisor. We invited 10 residency programs to ISCP for our first meeting. And in those beginning gatherings, we introduced our institutions through site visits and discussions. Although we knew each other's programs tangentially, it was surprising how much we didn't know. In fact, a through line in all of our early talks was the invisibility of residencies, as so much of our work focuses on process, support, and research over production or presentation, which are generally the most visible aspects of contemporary art institutions. We met without the expectation of a formal outcome and to exchange ideas and learn from each other, and often focused on the macro issues around residencies. During the first meeting, it became apparent that our discussions were a revelation for all of us, and the working group, as we called it, became increasingly important these past seven years for the member institutions as a support structure and a network to collaborate and share resources and knowledge. Over the years, the group has met every few months, remaining informal, flexible, and mobile with non-hierarchical organization, and this is important. In a sense, Rethinking Residencies functions somewhat like a co-op, a power institution, or as one member remarked, an organism. In 2015, Rethinking Residencies began to host a private annual event for all the residents in our programs as well as one public program each year. We visited art institutions, held workshops, and even went to baseball games with our local and international residents. We also organized public discussions on topics such as organizational practice, publics and counter publics, partnership in residencies and hospitality. And these public programs took place at different member institutions. These public events were conceived as a forum to widen our discussion and to answer the questions we were asking internally as a group to open up the discussion, um, much like this very symposium. In March 2020, everything changed, as we know. I would suggest that residencies are engaged with bringing people together uh, more than most other kinds of art institutions, and as such, They've been completely transformed by our current realities. Especially in the first months of the pandemic, the Rethinking Residencies group really relied strongly on each other for support and information and to establish new protocols and ways of doing things in real time, all grounded in collaboration, not competition. Rethinking Residencies collectively raised more than $1 million in COVID relief for the member organizations from three remarkable foundations who we would like to thank now. The Stavros Niarchos Foundation, the Willem de Kooning Foundation, and Tiger Foundation. And their support has been uh, pivotal in keeping our institutions going um, during these times. And this brings us to this week's symposium. In 2009, 
Karen Helmerson, Program Director of Electronic Media and Film and Visual Arts at the New York State Council of the Arts, NISCA, learned about our group and invited us to a meeting to discuss our ideas and initiatives. Learning of our aim to produce knowledge about the residency field, she encouraged us to apply to a NISCA grant to fund a symposium and publication that we had long dreamed of producing. As many of you know, there is a real lack of substantial publications on residencies, although in the last few years, the writing of the history and theory of residencies is increasing. There's even a university course taught on the subject, and we're lucky that tomorrow, Amreli Coco, who's the editor of co-editor of perhaps the, the most comprehensive book on residencies is joining us. The NISCA grant that we received is the major funder of this symposium and an immense thank you is owed to Karen Helmerson for her support and encouragement. Over the next three days, more than 20 international speakers will share their insights on residencies with us. While the symposium was originally intended to take place in physical space, we are excited that speakers will be joining us from their current locations in Colombia, Ecuador, Finland, Israel, Morocco, Palestine, Taiwan, the Netherlands, and the United States. It's important to note here that all Rethinking Residencies member institutions are based in the US, in New York, and we have blind spots. Yet we acknowledge the gaps in our knowledge and are excited for what we will learn from our peers over these next days. These sessions, as well as four pre-recorded videos, will address pressing issues in the residency field, such as how residencies can learn from social and political movements, how to best support artists and curators, community partnerships, the environmental impact of residencies, accessibility in residencies, and the decolonization of residency institutions. This symposium has been a collective endeavor in every single way, and there are many people to thank especially all the Rethinking Residencies members, present and past, and our inspiring speakers. The Artistic Committee, uh, Nova Benway, Christina Daniels, Dylan Gauthier, Susan Hapgood, Eileen Jake Lynch, and Ariola Pira worked on the content together with myself and the Steering Committee, who led on logistics, including Lindsay Berfins, Bora Kim, Craig Peterson, Nat Rowe, and Nick Wiest. Also, a great thank you to Doa Batili, who helped with the symposium coordination, our fantastic Zoom producers, Sarah O'Connell and Izzy Dow, as well as our production assistants, Agil Martinez and Amy Zai. And thank all of you so much for attending. Throughout the symposium planning, we often asked ourselves, who will our audience be? We had overwhelming interest and responses in the symposium, and now, hundreds of you are joining us from all over the globe. This indicates the importance of residencies for contemporary art, and most importantly, the artists and curators and researchers and so on that residencies support. We want to hear from you throughout the symposium and after the symposium. You can find our contact on our website, rethinkingresidencies.org. And a publication based on this symposium will be launched in late spring 2022. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Christina Daniels, Head of Residencies and Classes at Pioneer Works, who will be moderating the keynote conversation with two remarkable artists that I love, Mara Lada Renukulis and Tanya Kanziani, whose work is deeply entwined with residencies. Thank you. Hi. Um... As Carrie said, my name is Christina Daniels. I'm the head of residencies and classes at Pioneer Works, and I'm so excited to be moderating this conversation with Meryl Lauterman Euclides and Tanya Candiani to hear more about their respective residency experiences and how it played into their practice. Euclides has been the official unsalaried artist in residence at New York City's Department of Sanitation since 1977. And Candiani has participated in numerous residency programs throughout North America, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Europe. With that, I will let Tanya start us off. Hi. Hello, everyone. I am, I'm honored to be here. I'm super excited to share with all of you um, about this um, 
theme, which is the residencies. Uh, my practice has uh, producing learning, being at residencies has been very important part of my practice. Next one, please. My first residency was at Beeman Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha, Nebraska, where I was given a studio that it was so big that I was able to ride a bike inside my studio. I arrived with a sewing machine and some ideas in mind about a project about the politics of the domestics in Mexico. Next, please. It was in the seventh floor of Beeman's residency where I discovered the discursive power of household objects where I found a huge amount of objects donated uh, by local companies to the residency. Objects wasn't part of my practice until then. During two periods of two months, each one, I produced the sculptures, installations that I photographed and then dismantled. It was also the first time ever that I have the experience of work, work in a community of other artists because I didn't go to the art school. So it was my first time to be actually working with a group of artists in the same place. Next one, please. Produce our work is not a prerogative in the contracts of artists in residency programs, but in my case, it is. Uh, when I was the first resident at the Colombian program Flora Ars Natura in, um, in a place called Onda Tolima, which is in the, um, in the border of the Rio Magdalena, um, I, the invited artists didn't supposed to make anything. The purpose was to explore and think. And I explore and think a lot, but also I had the most productive three weeks I ever had in a studio. Nature and community nurtured my processes and practice, and it was a very rich and extremely productive residency period that ended up in a big exhibition with most than seven pieces and a couple of videos. Next one, please. When you are given a studio and you are vibrating in the same place with other minds and spirit, some alchemy happens in terms of creativity. Ura residency in Buenos Aires happened in a big warehouse with practical separation for create eight individual spaces, but without a door. And energy circulated all around the, the warehouse and created friendships, uh, critical thinking, and generated a symphony of all of us working together, even though we started projects in collaboration during those three months. Next one, please. When I was invited to Lasnia Center for Contemporary Arts for first time, I got there with a project consisting in create an atlas for the neighborhood where the residency is located in the suburbs of Dansk in Poland. The whole base of my proposed project consisted in conversations and shared readings with a group of neighbors. In my first meeting with the participants, I realized none of them speak English and no, I don't speak Polish. Um, so I had to reconfigure and create with them other ways of communication. We worked and laughed a lot and together found ways to share personal story, city narrations with other means but words. I returned to Lasnia two more times. Next one, please. I have known El Valle de Guadalupe since I was living in Tijuana. El Valle transformed in an extraordinary region of wine producers and also is the place where some beloved friends live since they were kids. I visited many times El Valle when I was young. We used to spend the nights near a big fire, having conversations, cooking, dancing. Returning to a place where you feel at home, but for work there for first time, is a has a tremendous beauty and significance. And also the fact that I was producing a permanent site-specific sound installation in the middle of the landscape. Next, please. Casa Guave Residency is in the coast of Puerto Escondido in Oaxaca, Mexico. It is extremely beautiful, but at the same time, it turned out to require a different set of mind in order to be productive. The building by the famous architect Tadao Ando is a bit overwhelming, and it was difficult to create a personal relation with the architectonical space. But on the other hand, it was a beautiful process of, adapt of adapting to the site 
and finding materials to work within, within the same nature. Next one, please. Paos in Guadalajara, Mexico was a program that unfortunately just closed a month ago after seven years of intensive and productive interchange between local artists and invited guests. My proposal for the residency was to conduct a workshop to produce a piece in collaboration uh, that it was a way of working I was already doing in Mexico City in a project called Atlas. The experience at PAUS was short in time, but huge in experiences and content. I learned from the integrants of the team about the city and I shared with them another way of reading their city. Another, next one, please. One thing is working in collaboration with eight people and another one is trying to involve as many persons as possible how to mapping, how to create a taxonomy. In Salina, Kansas, I proposed a piece in collaboration with as many integrants of the community as possible. It was a huge process of conversations, visits, share food to create a food quilt that we weave and hang together. Next, please. Traveling with a sewing machine has been part of my practice. When I was preparing this presentation and searching for photos from my past temporary studios, I found out that in many cases, in the photos, there was a sewing machine. Next, please. Um, the sewing machine represents a possibility of solving in a language that I already know, but also it's a way to use the same instrument, the same tool, the language of stitching to connect with those other places. Next one, please. A residency outdoors in a cactus field was an extraordinary experience, a meditative process, a more introspective way of hearing nature and connect with the sound of bugs, wind, mosquitoes, fresh air, just completely different context. Next, please. Working and thinking in common with art students to create together is a process that I enjoy very much. I was guest artist at Shristi University in Bangalore, India. So during the period of residency, my studio became the studio of all. I conducted the research, we found things together, make sketches, models and plans. And then we all traveled to the city of Kochi to create an installation during the Kochi Biennial. It was an extraordinary and fresh way of working and the outcome reflected it. Next one, please. La Constancia was one of the most prominent fact textile factories in Mexico. When I got there, it was being in, back in bankrupt with a very sad story about the workers being cheated by the owners. Instead of paying the salaries, they gave them the factory to cover the debt. Unfortunately, the machines in the factory were obsolete and the whole place went to the decay. It was literally falling into pieces. I proposed to cure the abandoned factory with work. I installed my workshop there and I spent a month sewing a diary related to stories from the former workers. Next one, please. The experiences in the project Exoplanet Lot in the Lot Valley was transformative. My studio home was in a medieval tower. After dinner in the common house, I returned to my tower to read medieval love, medieval love and war novels. Next, next one, please. But that place has also another story that goes beyond in time and permeated all of us. The one of the first settlers that have left off their paintings and symbols in the caves. We all were struck by the, by the antiquity in a good way. In the communal house, we organized dinners and drink a lot of wine, sharing our amazement of the deep time in the things and the ge geological space we were all sharing. Next one, please. There are other places that may doesn't look like extraordinary in terms of the space, but with a big table and a nice big wall, it's possible to interweave thinking and process. Next one, please. A residency in a whiskey factory sound as fancy and as it actually was. The whole environment was quite an inspiration from producing, um, for producing while doing long walks. It was a paradise in all the meaning of words. Next one, please. Next one, please. Artista por Artista uh, is settled in a big and bright apartment in Havana, Cuba. Um, I spent there a couple of months creating in the place that lit, uh, little by little was 
filling up with objects and drawings. And at the end, we just opened the door for an exhibition. Next one, please. Um, ISCP was my first residency in New York. And it was very important for me because it was the most, uh, in, um, the most professional uh, created in terms of I receive a lot of visits of curators. I create amazing relationship and friendship that I that survive until now. Um, my time at, at, um, at uh, ISCP was really fruitful uh, in, and it ended up in an exhibition at Abrams Art Center that was curated by Miguel Amado, which was one of the visiting curators that visited, visited us during 2011 when I was resident. Next one, please. Also with the research I did in ISCP, I was able to write a project about um, similarities be between um, an architectonic modernism in Mexico City and New York uh, with, the, with that project I had the Guggenheim Fellowship. Next one, please. Archives are, are a space for thinking and researching and uh, I started applying for residences specifically for research. Uh, I was lucky to be in the um, Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. Next one, please. Where I was amazed by uh, all these uh, folders full of inventions and papers and books of people and the phantom of knowledge all over. I was amazed by doing findings and understanding chance as a process of creation. Next one, please. And this is the last residency I've been. I just returned a couple of days ago from a month residency in New York City, um, where I was doing a three month res residency in the archives of Lincoln Center. Next one, please. So, but none of the last places um, have been a productive place. Next one, please. Unless the people, all the people that became friends or became collaborators in all the places. Next one, please. Can we just pass it uh, every second, please? So um, I was, I have been lucky to just find a uh, um, group of people to work with, um, finding um, ways of creating dialogues in the places, sharing knowledge, and all is about the generosity. I mean, being in a residency where you come from a, from afar and you then interrupt their um, daily lives and they open the doors to you in order to play with you, to um, let your imagination invite them to think in other terms about their 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 place where they live. So um, all these persons that are uh, portraying in the photos and much more are the real part of the residencies. Um, the real material of the work, the work many times is made by the, the um, assume uh, it's a, it, we are adding things all the time. I, I believe that um, residencies act like a big atlases where there's many uh, eyes uh, building a wide, wide open vision of the world. So that's what happened um, with the people. And um, I try to create um, bounds with um, all the people that I work with. Um, sometimes it's not as possible because some of them doesn't use the internet as, as, as we normally do. But with many of them, we have, uh, we have, we, be keeping in conversation and it's very excited um, the moment of becoming became someone else with them and thanks to them. Next next one please. And let's go to the till the landscape, please. Also I want to mention that uh, for me it's important to cook for people in residency. So um I am um, I have a tradition of making mole, the mole day for everyone. So whenever it's a kitchen, I propose a Mexican dinner 
for all of us. Um, and there is also an, a beautiful uh, factor, which is the landscape. And of course, uh, moving far from where, for, from places where we're used to, um, it just completely put us in a new way of thinking and perceiving. Being in an open nature, I mean, I live in Mexico City, so it's always enjoyable to have this swift, swift in the, in the vision and being permeated of these new realities. Um, I've been lucky to be um, experiencing this amazing landscape and really finding time to be touched by it. Um, my work will, is, is what it is because of, because of all this images and people and new places that has been creating all these different languages and connections in my work. Residences are words within words. So um, I really want to keep traveling in these other words and adding experiences to my work. So we are almost, yes, that's the, 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 the beauty of the words within the words. So, Let's keep traveling. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's a great honor to be with you all over. Um, Carrie sent me four questions about um, my residence experience. I'm going to just run through them. Question number one, how it came about. How I got to the Department of Sanitation in New York. To save my life as an artist, I wrote Manifesto for Maintenance Art, 1969, Proposal for an Exhibition Care. It was a call for a world revolution for care workers, public, and private to demand entry as full creating equals into Western culture. 1969 to 1976, for seven years, I created small performances inside and outside, at home, on the street, in museums, private and public, some alone, some with a few maintenance workers and me. In 1976, I was invited to be in a group exhibition called Art World with two arrows at the downtown branch of the Whitney Museum on the second floor of 55 Water Street, a 3.5 million square foot a uh, skyscraper, one of the largest skyscrapers in Manhattan, a very tony office building maintained 24 seven by 300 maintenance workers. It was the most people I could imagine making an art performance with. I invited all the workers on all shifts to create I Make Maintenance Art one hour every day with me. By choosing one hour every day to consider their regular work as art, I would move all over the building throughout the seven weeks of the exhibition, take a Polaroid of the worker at work, and then ask her or him to name whether it was maintenance work or maintenance art. I transferred the power of naming what you see to the worker. I labeled each photo as they directed. By the end of the exhibition, there were 720 photographs of what I saw and 720 decisions of what the workers decided that you saw mounted in the museum. The workers came to the museum for the first time in power. David Bourdon, the art critic, 
gave it a great review in the Village Voice. He suggested that the sanitation department consider its regular work as performance art and qualify for a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to replace some of their cut budget in the current dire fiscal crisis. Hmm, the sanitation department. I sent this review to the commissioner of sanitation. I got a call from his assistant, Francis Carroll. How would you like to make art with 10,000 people? I'll be right over. That began the next four decades of my life. In October, 1976, I met with the commissioner and his assistant, Gloria Johnson. Show her around, he said to Gloria. She proceeded to do just that. She drove me all over New York City, day after day, sections, incinerators, training classes, landfills, headquarters, trade shops. I interpreted this invitation by sanitation to create with total access. Thus began one and a half years of tremendous research from 1977 to 1979. How did I get my project workspace, my office? How did I move into sanitation? Every day I arrived carrying a huge bag because I didn't know where I would be going with Gloria Johnson. Finally, exasperated, she said, you're always carrying such a heavy bag. Put your bag down at that desk, it's empty. Why don't you use this office space? I ended up in a grand, large office space overlooking City Hall. Thus seated, I thought big thoughts. That's how I got my office. Through the years, I moved along with sanitation to other spaces in that building, then to 44 Beaver Street in Lower Manhattan, where my office is today. This building houses citywide ancillary headquarters activities of sanitation, fresh kills, landfill engineering, recycle, recycling, sustainability planning, health services and clinic, and me. The largest project office space for several years, I had three large connected offices and a storage room. This enabled me to prepare to organize and ship most of my papers to the Smithsonian Institution's Archives of American Art. Now I have a smaller office, but it is still chock full of file cabinets, storage cabinets, and shelves. Also sanitation provides storage of my ceremonial arch in a sea container given to me by the Queens Museum to protect it along with other storage space inside the massive central repair shop in Maspeth, Queens, where the social mirror, the mirror garbage truck has a special berth. I developed a whole host of proposals from 1977 on. I presented my proposals and thinking to the new commissioner, Norman Steisel, who was appointed in 1978. He accepted the first one and an approved support for the others. We worked together. Then he made a critical move. While I was developing a whole host of proposals called Maintenance Art Meets the Department of Sanitation, the new commissioner, wrote a memorandum to the Department of Sanitation Executive Committee, Borough Superintendents, Assistant Borough Superintendents, District Superintendents, introducing Eucalys, me, and as art writer Patricia Phillips wrote, quote, the potential, 
the potentially preposterous idea of an artist in residence without actually saying it and asking for their support and cooperation to all these levels of the sanitation structure, an unlikely collaboration of a feminist maintenance artist and one of New York's biggest and toughest municipal organizations. There was no entity, there was no program for artists in residence. We actually invented the whole concept of my being the artist in residence, official and unsalaried. We made it up, we made it up. Blessedly, this accepted level of full access for the artist throughout the department was a concept that was passed along as a kind of cultural understanding by each successive commissioners over four decades of continuing work. How has it nourished your work? Question number two. Maintenance artworks meets the New York City Department of Sanitation, written in 1977-78. The scale of the Department of Sanitation as a form, I wrote, a network of flowing garbage. The goal is to quote, feel in the gut, the immensities and endlessness to gather up a whole system at one time, to contextualize a whole system in proper scale, including complicating factors such as fiscal crisis and pollution. I developed and honed these many proposals down to a triad of three kinds of projects that I have realized or continued to work on at scale for four decades, continuing now. One, face all the workers. Say thank you for keeping New York City alive everywhere. This turned into touch sanitation in all 59 sanitation districts of New York over 11 months in a very beleaguered time. Two, performing the city, urban material flows handled with immense skills by city workers turned into seven work ballets and other city performances in New York City, other cities, and internationally. Three, landfills, sites for public urban earthworks, public land, accessible on public transportation in contrast to the classic privately owned land of American earthworks that I loved. Landfills were truly public places that we have all made together with our own waste. Many projects have happened with huge, amazing in-kind cooperation from DSNY. Nothing is ever assumed. There have been a lot of no's, but I kept trying and I am still keeping trying. The relationship became more complex when I was ordered a Department of Cultural Affairs Percent for Art Commission as Artist of Fresh Kills in 1989 and still ongoing. This has lengthened my duration at sanitation. It brought me my favorite motto, never give up. Um, am I, how I started at um, um, here 1040. So I have five, 10, I have five more minutes. Can somebody nod for me? Do I have five, five or eight more minutes? 
Question three, hard challenges. One, money. I wasn't paid. It was hard on my family. I spent a, a huge amount of time raising dollars for my projects. I accepted this as part of the deal. I look back at how utterly willing I was to accept responsibility to raise the financial support for my own projects. Was this the best way to work? Other hard challenges, sadness, anger, fury during touch sanitation, not to become overwhelmed by hearing day after day over 11 months, people working so hard yet feeling so unseen, so unhonored, so public, yet so outside the culture. Three, the mid 1970s fiscal crisis was a real crisis. There was a hysteria afoot. People were panicky that they would get laid off. During this time in New York City, the municipal workforce was reduced by 60,000 jobs. Another fear was that the city, the sanitation department would be sold to the private carters, privatized. There was much yelling in the garages, dire fear of bankruptcy in New York City. Ironically, this worked in my favor sometimes. Some executive decision makers felt things couldn't get any worse. <clears throat> so what the hell? Why not try doing something with this artist? Four, 9-11-2001 trauma. My office is near the World Trade Center. I had left my window open. So the death, deadly and death-filled white dust covered everything. 1996, sudden announcement of the closure of Fresh Kills by 2001. This had a fatal impact on my biggest to date long-term permanent project called Flow City. Six, simply the present scale of funding for large public out artworks is simply not big enough for large scale permanent public artworks, fresh kills, great people, wonderful projects, decades of work and many budget problems. Never give up. Terrific growth challenges. To be able to respond daringly to invitations and opportunities. I have had great support from sanitation through decades. As well, it is the art world that has given financial grants and fellowships and a kind of professional, even spiritual support. A huge challenge to make new kinds of collaborations between sanitation and other arts organizations benefiting from sanitation's willingness to work, to work with others totally out of the box. Queens Museum, Creative Time, PS1, Municipal Arts Society, Rotterdam Sanitation Department, LA MOCA, all of different kinds of help and support from sanitation and an unparalleled collaboration between my gallery, Ronald Feldman and sanitation, especially during Touch Sanitation show. Recently, things are changing. A new kind of effort is growing. I have had a lot of support from sanitation as well as the Sanitation Foundation, which now has an ongoing permanent cultural and educational wing headed by Maggie Lee. And a special word to finish about pairs, public artists in residence. I proposed it an original concept in, to sanitation as the unsalaried sanitation artists in residence and to the Department of Cultural Affairs. I had no doubt 
that it was a terrific idea. But frankly, I had a practical claim, aim to get paid. When I brought this up inside of sanitation, the sanitation people said to me, Eucles, if we pay you, we'd have to cut a sweeper driver. You wouldn't want that, would you? So I thought if funding for someone like me could come out of the mayor's overall executive budget, then the specific agency wouldn't feel it lost budget to pay the artists. So I proposed 10 city agencies would have what I call pairs, public artists and residents. And all 10 artists would be paid through the mayor's ex executive budget, a win-win. A good start 38 years ago, I was invited to many meetings at the Department of Cultural Affairs to get this pairs program going in 1984, 38 years ago, but it didn't happen. And now I'm thrilled to say that pairs exists, quote, inspired, as DCA always says, with generosity by my artists in residence in sanitation. It is a thriving, ongoing program in New York City in the Department of Cultural Affairs. It is successful and it is expanding all over the United States. And a brilliant new idea has been added. Cultural affairs has an ongoing connection with each agency and each artist to support the artist's needs and be sensitive to the agency's concerns, a kind of trust building and protection for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you much, so much, uh, both of you for your presentation. Um, I wanna start out this conversation seeing as your residency's ex experience are very different. Um, and Meryl, you even noted that you made your residency up. Um, <laughs> can you, how would you define a residency? I feel like we're gonna learn over these three days how broad residencies are and what their purpose is for many different artists throughout their uh, stages of their career. And I would love if you could kind of um, give us a top level idea, whether that's um, more idealistic or practical based on your own experiences. Or you're asking me? Both of you. Okay. Tanya, you go first. Okay, man. Well, first, let me thank you for your presentation. I mean, I'm, it was very inspiring and, and um, having looking at all the work have you been done in, in one only place, which goes beyond one only place. It's just like very exciting and inspiring and thank you. Um, and definitely we have very different um, ways of understanding these processes. Um, uh, in my case, um, it's not that I'm looking for residencies um, anymore. At the beginning of my career, I definitely was looking for a space to work, a workshop, to having a, um, a, a big space for work and also to be able to create dialogues with artists from several other places. Um, so um, international residencies are, uh, were, were very great for the beginning of my career and also because I was able to produce a lot in terms of creating a portfolio. When you are a very young artist, like emerging artists, you need to create a portfolio in order to keep working and being invited to other things. Then I start doing it residencies for of production, which were based in site specific projects. Those are like an evolution of that of the, that first first uh, uh, residencies, which are more based in creating uh, dialogue with the community, understanding new ways of seeing the history of places, trying to get deep and find the story to share with others, uh, providing a new gaze a different gaze of, of the place and the story of the place. 
Um, and now I'm more interested in research residencies and traveling to places that have hold, holds files and papers that I'm not able to find back home. Um, so, um, yeah. And of course, sorry, the monetary part is important. I am in the economic part. It's so important that you mention it that like it has to be uh, programs that pay you a fee. Uh, so because you have a lot of expenses back home that has to be considered if you're traveling, you have to pay. I mean, I have to pay my studio at home and the people that works in my studio and also I have to pay my rent. And I, was, I mean, there's so many things to consider which are important. Artists needs to be paid. We are workers and we work hard, so. <laughs> the, um, it's wonderful to meet you, Tanya, <laughs> and to hear about your travels and the tentacles that you create everywhere with people and bring them in. So my residency is so, di so different. I think that for me, um, sanita getting invited to make art with 10,000 people in the sanitation department was like getting called up to the major leagues of the maintenance world. I was thrilled to be there. And yet when I, I, to I told people that I was the, main, the artist of the sanitation department, mostly over many years, in truth, they laughed. They thought, how crazy, how ridiculous. Why does sanitation need an artist in residence? What's so compelling for an art? To me, who was, I was so fixated on maintenance, what does it take to keep going, to keep alive on the earth? This was the biggest, the best, the clearest uh, example of service, of service work, of endlessness, endlessness of work that will be there for forever. So for me, conceptually, it was the, the high point of, a, of my travels through many performances at smaller scale than a little bigger scale, um, to be able to work with the greatest experts who know, for example, who know where everyone is in New York, they have to because they have to come find your garbage. That's a little scary to meet people that know where everybody is. They have maps. They know. They know so much. It was a, a huge learning opportunity for me. Um, as a feminist, so pissed off that when people would meet me as a mother maintenance worker, they didn't ask, tell us about your art. Tell us about your experiences. They would say, do you do anything? And I was going crazy trying to keep going as a mother, keep going as an artist. I refused to give up. And that's why I decided I call maintenance art. So for me, the place that you want to talk about maintenance, they know about maintenance. That would be a huge field for me to deal with maintenance and all the stupid, ridiculous prejudices that people have toward those who do this kind of work. So it's been such a great uh, opportunity, this residence and the, and the generosity 
from one commissioner and administration to another, passing along what has become a cultural tradition of opening up, opening up uh, what actually historically has been a very siloized bureaucracy. There's disposal, there's collection, there's recycling, there's engineering, and you don't really mix into each other except the artist was given open access from the very beginning because of the generosity of Commissioner Norman Steisel. And every commissioner since then has, has provided that openness. The money is a problem. Tanya, it's a problem. <laughs> um, so being as residencies can be access to experts like the DSNY, and they could provide everything from creating portfolio and production space and research. How do you organize your work plan or your research when you're entering into such like an open, endless opportunity, especially, you know, when you two have had very different experiences as far as time, like it seems like Tanya, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like a lot of your residencies often range between like three months or so, um, maybe with the exception of a couple. And Meryl, yours has been, has it been 40 years um, without Four. doing the math? Yeah, how, how, one thing, 44, 44. 44. <laughs> how do you navigate such openness and at some time such limited time to one, get into a community and uh, make yourself known, get acclimated to um, all the resources and just like limitations and some of that being financial limitations. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, in my case, um, I learned how to um, to start before. I mean, I, I start creating that relations through the eyes of the curator that invites me, for example, if it's for this kind of residencies that I mentioned, which are producing production residencies. So I, um, I work very close to the locals, if it's a curator or if, a, if a, it's a group of researchers in the site I'm gonna visit, I start by online and also I start researching online in order to find that, that findings that kind of became the project. So um, um, once I get to, to the site, I plan the first meetings um, based on what my interest my interested was uh, but always happened that once you have you are in the real place there's so many things that change in the project i mean i i arrive always with a with an open mind to be completely touched by this the, the place and switching the the ideas so that's that's why it's super important to have those meetings soon and being close to the community when you speak the language. When you don't speak the language, like, uh, like the example I was uh, uh, sh um, sh uh, showing in Poland, it's a, it's a completely other way of sharing and finding interesting ways of communicating with others. And that was probably the reason that I returned to, to Dansk several times, because we create a language for us, which was not, not based in words. It was based in the fun and the laughing and the experience of walking together um, a place that they were showing to me. So, um, so I organized in that way. Also, I understood that as, as soon as I arrived to a place for make, it's important for me to feel at home. That's why I call like temporary homes and temporary studios. So I move the table near the window, uh, bring a lamp, hang something, and I create a mini, mini or no mini, like a proto space, uh, which is my own. And it, I learned how to do that very quickly. At the beginning, it, it took me, I mean, in, in ISCP, it took me a month to feel really comfortable in the studio. And it's just based in, I don't know, um, 
learn. It's a process of learning all the time. There, um, I, I want to mention a few a few projects because they there's um, I, my work is extremely site specific and project specific. Um, I was um, invited to uh, create a work ballet in Rotterdam for an international performance art festival called Perfo in 1985. And what, what did I, I wanted, um, actually I was invited to do a performance in Rotterdam. Um, and, and I wanted to sh make a work that shows the ubiquity and the universality of maintenance work, that I could go anywhere and work, know how to work with workers. Because if you want to live there, you do the same kind of work no matter where you are. Um, so I asked to work with the sanitation workers. But it's a little strange. This was 1985, sort of not so many people knew about my, what, I, what I was doing. So I went to the commissioner of sanitation and I asked the commissioner, this was Commissioner Dougherty, please write to your peer commissioner in Rotterdam and tell them about me that I'm not crazy, but I wanna work with the sanitation workers there to show that no matter where you are, this is happening all over the, all over the world. The same thing is happening all over the world. So I was able to make this uh, plan starting in New York, arriving in Rotterdam, meeting the sanitation workers. And, and uh, with, with these work ballets, I always insisted that people be paid their regular work because uh, it's not a hobby. It's not to be done after work on the weekend. This is work, the art is work like their regular work. The di so what happens is if they approve the project, they'll give me three or four days. I always ask for two weeks to work with the workers and come up with an, um, a choreography. And they say three days, maybe three and a half days because it's expensive. So I have to work really, really fast um, and listen so hard to the, to the workers. And I've had incredible experiences in uh, seven, making seven work ballets, often with people who do not speak English, like Tanya was saying. Uh, I'm dependent upon translators. Um, I did two ballets in Northern Japan where I found the day of the, of the, of the ballet that the workers were, were sort of having a big argument. And I thought, oh my God, what is happening? So I said to my translator, Oz, what are they saying? And she said, I don't, I don't know. I don't speak their Northern dialect. I don't understand what they're saying. And I said, well, ask someone else. So ask someone what is going on. And they said, they don't speak that Northern. The, the people from the mm -hmm. art project, this big international art project, they speak Tokyo Jap Japanese. Nobody spoke the Northern dialect except one person who could speak Tokyo Japanese and the Northern dialect. And I, and I was, didn't realize that I was dependent upon this one single person to transfer. I made drawings and we worked it out. We had three days and it was magnificent. I, uh, there's, one, there's one other story that goes back to the beginning of working with um, uh, sanitation workers to make an artwork. I was invited 
to do the grand finale of the first New York City Art Parade in 1983. And I, who had the, the, there's photographs that you saw of sanitation's traditional role in a lot of parades was sweeping up the horse droppings. Like everybody else is very erect and proud. And then the sanitation workers bent over shoveling the horse droppings to the side, not on parade, but working. <coughs> So my dream was to make a parade where sanitation would be the parade, in the parade. And I was invited by Creative Time and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council to do a collaboration to make the grand finale of the New York City Art Parade. One of the three movements that I designed was called Ballet Mécanique, named after Leger's Ballet Mécanique's uh, for, for six mechanical sweepers. I knew how phenomenal these mechanical sweeper drivers were by walking behind the sweeper, driving with them during touch sanitation. <coughs> they were amazing. Horrible, difficult work of double park cars, triple park cars, craziness on the street. <coughs> They gave, when they finally approved this project, they gave me a little wooden shack on Randall's Island at the edge of the training field for the um, laid out like streets of Manhattan, <coughs> excuse me, to teach the sanitation workers how to drive trucks. I, I said, give me the six, six greatest sweeper drivers in New York. <coughs> okay, Euclid, you have three days. And I come there, I sit down, six big strong sanitation workers enter, sit down at a table. And I say to them how much I admire their work and I've been invited to create this grand finale of the first New York City Art Parade. And I want to create a ballet, uh, of, a ballet of sweepers with them so that my job is to clear away the traffic that's on the street so that their skills can become vis visible. And they said to me, what do you, what do you want us to do? Tell us what to do. And I said to them, I'm not your boss. And I can't tell you what to do. I would like us to work together and come up with something together. And it went dead silent. And I realized that Sanitation is like a semi-military hierarchy. These are very highly skilled people, but they're used to being told, this is your task today, go here, do this, do that, this many blocks, this many, this and that. They don't just make up their own work, they're told what to do. That's how the department divides up the work of the whole entire city. It was silent. I felt like a meter is ticking, like tick, tick, tick. I say, Eucalys, you're gonna make the biggest jerk out of yourself in New York, cause nothing's gonna happen. But I also said to myself as an artist, I said, keep your mouth shut. They have to listen and know that you meant that you're not the boss and you're not gonna tell them what to do. So I was silent. Tick, tick, tick. I was flipping out. And then one of the drivers said, well, we could do this and that and this and that. 
And the other guy said, nah, I think that would look pretty stupid. And then the ideas that, see, I knew that they drive these very powerful machines. They're, they're sitting in power all day long, but they're very restricted in what they can do. But in their imaginations, you can imagine what went on. And my job was to open those doors and let their imagination flower. <coughs> That's what I could do. The ideas flew and we got up and walked out of the wooden shack and they got into their sweepers and we knocked out a magnificent ballet in three days. I think that's beautiful. Um, I think I, I want to make sure there's time for questions, but I want to say thank you to both of you for sharing. And um, I think there's a lot to be said about just like opening up the residency and providing access to others, whether it be people from community, international communities or the sanitation workers um, that you worked with at the DSNY. Um, and just how fruitful that can be. And um, I'll open it up to questions. All right, here we go. Carrie, would you mind resending those to me? Okay, here we go. So question one, um, could you share a bit about what you see as the challenges or the benefits of being the sole artist in residence, Meryl? Um, Tanya, could you compare the experience of working alone to working with other artists in, residence, in a residency? Um, Meryl, did you have any moments where you wish you had other collaborators and would fill a position alongside you? Or Wait, was say that again. Say that, say, that, say that last thing again. I didn't get it. Um, were there ever moments when you wish you had other collaborators at the DSNY? Or was Would working I... with the maintenance workers uh, satisfying? Do, do you need me to repeat that? Yeah, you um, repeat the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, so to, to some, um, for both of you, were there ever times when How about you... Tanya go first now? That sounds great. Tanya, were there ever times when you um, could compare your the experience of working alone to working with other artists in a residency? Well, um, I think it's a, it's both are very enjoyable, but completely different. Yes, in in terms of it depends where you are. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if you are based in a share studio then what happened, it's, uh, it's very, it's pretty amazing because you are watching the practices of the others. You are, they have, they, they, you have an open up um, space to share the way you work. So it's very intimate way of collaborating with the other. So you can hear how they thought. Uh, so it's pretty amazing that kind of, uh, Colega, like I working with older artists and thinking, seeing them how fast they produce or not, of how they create their models or draws and blah. Also, enjoy very much when you are sharing a space of living. So you have this communal kitchen for dinners, and you can cook for the others, and it's a way of um, being in a fastest way, like a, like a family. Um, when I'm alone, I'm, I have more chance to explore uh, and uh, adapt myself to what is outside my, my own studio and my own world, my own little world. world. Um, and it gives me a lot of time to think as well and to um, modulate the ways of navigating places. Um, I walk a lot alone. I, 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 like, I enjoy that time as well. That 
Um, for example, in the last residency at, at Amant, even though it was a, a, a residency with four studios, with, with three amazing artists, because it was a resident, it was a, a residency for research. I was not there ever. So we shared a chat and they were, I don't know, uh, offering teas or having lunch all together. And I was in the Lincoln Center in the archive. So I miss a very much the time of creating that uh, very close connections, no? Um, and kind of in the reverse for you, Meryl, um, did you ever wish you had collaborators or did working with the maintenance workers feel satisfying? Yeah, I. Uh, the sanitation department has many different kinds of people working there. For example, I have enjoyed uh, long multi-year collaborations with landfill engineer, the, uh, landfill engineering, the, their head of uh, end use planning, recycling planning, sustainability planning, um, chiefs, operations chiefs. Uh, there are multiple different kinds of, of uh, architects, uh, consulting architects, landscape architects, um, a whole host of other kinds of um, uh, professional designers and um, film, filmmaker, the, the Michael Anton, the photographer of, of sanitation, uh, Robin Nagel, the anthropologist in residence of the sanitation. We have an art anthropology, anthropologist in residence also. And now there's a new artist in residence, Snow Stowe Len, um, who will make his own projects. But I think that the, the, the scale of the work that I ha have ended up doing that you have seen is often very, very large. Um, so uh, um, it takes so much time. And then trying to raise funding takes so much time that uh, I end up actually um, not collaborating with other artists, uh, but with many, always collaborating with many, many other kinds of people, both um, artists and different kinds of professionals and workers that represent the, it's like a whole huge city unto itself. Um, I, I made a piece called re-entry that was uh, several slides that was 90 feet long in the main gallery of PS1 that was, um, made entirely of recyclables. It was uh, in 1987, I think at the very beginning when recycling was shifting from uh, voluntary local neighborhood recyclers to become the law in New York City. Very difficult transition. And I made a 90 foot long ramp that you could walk, I wanted you to walk through a progression of 11 different kinds of materials in the first stages of, of turning from one, from objects into something else. Plastic, glass, tire shards, dewatered dredge spoils, computers, uh, uh, Christmas trees that had been turned into um, uh, Mulch, mulching material, steel, um, lights. And to do that, I worked uh, with local recyclers, a great recycler named David Hurd, who took one week's newspapers, the first project in Gren Greenwich Village, and stacked up an entire gallery floor to ceiling of newspapers. I worked with sanitation workers who, who did a huge amount of physics. There, there are many, many tons of materials. Um, I, I 
the, the department gave me the paint shop over the weekend and I, and I cast glass into panels uh, on, the, on the long distance phone with Roman Haas, the polyester resin experts who kept telling me, this is not gonna work. These crushed glass pieces are gonna fall apart. You can't cast glass like that in polyester resin and fiberglass. And I said to them, listen, you guys, the show is opening up in a few weeks and I'm going, I'm going. And we went in and we cast and the, and the piece lasted for year, years and years and years. Okay. Um, but it was a mega collaboration. Um, I have two more questions in the interest of time, um, kind of a follow up on collaboration for Tanya. Um, and I just lost it. Should the degree of collectiveness among artists and a shared residency be determined by the curators before? Well, wow. can you repeat it again? Should the degree of collectiveness among artists in a shared residency be determined before? Uh, by the curators, determined by the curators. No, I don't think it can be determined by the curator because it's a very personal um, um, way of happening. It, it depends on serendipity, actually. I mean, it's just uh, the way you arrive to a place and connect with people and uh, learn how to work with the other, um, make a proposal for something that you want to do, for example, to a craftsmanship to a woodmaker. He always, the woodmaker, it's is used to make furniture, but then you arrive and propose or, a, or a, a guitar maker, but you arrive with a with a proposal to create together, you have an idea. You wanna make an harp made in, let's say, in, um, um, uh, um, loom, so. I went there, I want to create a musical instrument based in a loom and the instrument maker said like, no, no, there is no way to create such a thing. Let's, well, let's find a way. I mean, I pretty much enjoy what Merle said. I have a, I totally agree with her. It's like, a, yeah, we can. Let's just find ways to do that. And that connection with community, it, it doesn't depend on the curator, curator, it depends on, you and the way you navigate right. your relations with, with the others, with, with yeah. Beautiful. Which and is always question. beautiful, no? It's always amazing how you can push yourself and others in their practice to just go a step beyond, like going further what they know how to do. So they knowledge okay. uh, uh, brights and then they, they, then, then they know that they are capable to do more than what they thought, no? Right. Yeah. Um, and our last question for both of you, how has your ideas of what a residency is changed over time? Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, things take too long. I used to have the most patience of anyone in the whole entire world to raise money, to try to write grants, to try to raise money, to support the, what I wanted to do, even after I got permission to do it and all kinds of in-kind help. I was inordinately patient. Um, well, I'm 82 and I'm not so patient anymore. Um, I think also uh, being the sole artist in residence in a place that's different from residencies that are set up to help to let artists have their time and space to do things, but with a lot of support there. The, the different kind of residencies that you're talking about but here where there's uh, now it's beginning to be more developed with the cultural wing from the sanitation foundation, luckily, where there's more support for the, what the artist needs to do. Um, 
I think that you can move along more quickly. A bureaucracy uh, can be fascinating, which it is, but it can also be risk averse, uh, slow. Um, people learn how to say no and are afraid to say yes. Uh, those things, um, things could happen quicker, much quicker. And Tanya? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I know how the programs have changed. I mean, I'm, I can tell how I've changed and how what I mean, I'm more interested in applying or not. Uh, but definitely it's important how we are um, seeing more and more, uh, which is something that I'm very interested in, uh, collaborations between, between science, scientists and artists. And there are many very interesting residences based for creating that collaboration and pushing that connections um, more in terms of economic, like uh, with good fees and good possibilities to creating pieces in such a way um, um, for when I teach, um, I always push the young artists to apply for residencies. I believe that it's truly important for um, emerging and young artists, most the ones that are in, in the school, when they left the art school, I think it's great for them to just jump into a residency and explore the way of working in an environment that they are not um, that they know they don't know. Uh, working with other artists that have never met until that moment, and also it's a way of experiencing the possibility of having a budget to pursue a project that hopefully will change within the time they, they spend over there, which means that they have to be, let the space change them, no? So, um, um, yeah, that's, yeah. I think those are great answers. Um, and with that, I wanna thank you both for your time and sharing about your experience. And I wanna pass it off to Carrie Conte for closing remarks. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Meryl. What a perfect way to start this symposium by hearing from artists and hearing about your experience in residencies. Um, you both spoke so much about space and people, and that's really the tenant um, or one of the two of the tenants of residencies. And Tanya, I, I thought the expression that a residency is a world within a world was completely spot on and Meryl describing your residency as an unlikely collaboration and to never give up and that you both kind of made it up as you went along uh, you know residencies are often without a designated outcome they're an infrastructure and support system where you can make up your time and you can make up your work and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that from all of our other speakers over the next uh, two days. So tomorrow we're coming back to this Zoom space and this link at 2 p.m. Armeli Coco will be presenting a talk on the history of residencies. And after that, uh, at 3.30 p.m., we have a discussion on representation, accountability, and solidarity in institutions and the artists they serve at 3.30. Uh, with residency directors from Cleveland, from Morocco, Palestine, and Amsterdam. And thank you all so much for joining us. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but you're always welcome to mail them to info at rethinkingresidencies.org. Thank you again, Tanya and Meryl and Christina, and we will see you all tomorrow. And the slideshow from the beginning of the day will run again for a few minutes if you want to stay on. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. <laughs>